start, yeah? Sure. Yep. Okay. Hello, everybody, in particular, Wayne, Pratik, and who has been participating, Dippin. Here we are live, intuitive simulation and measurement workflow for hardware engineers. My name is Tim Wang Lee. I recently got my PhD degree from University of Colorado in Boulder under Dr. Eric Bogatin, the SI guru. Um, Mike will be presenting in the second half of the presentation and he will for sure introduce himself then. And we're both signal integrity application scientists at Keysight Technologies. Without further ado, we will go to the first slide. Now I'm gonna, I wanna get to know everybody a little bit. So maybe in the Q and A, you can say whether you identify as a layout engineer, a hardware design engineer, or maybe an, an SI person, signal integrity SI person. Oh, in chat, let's see, Do in, in the Q and A, you just type in the answers. Do you, yeah. Okay, we can we can do the Q and A. All right, so Wayne is a hardware designer. Hardware, okay. You and so on. Okay. Okay, so majority of us are are hardware slash some SIs. So that's great. And I, I believe that given and thanks, Philip, given that we are aware there will be a simulation as always because for the lay from the layout perspective you start out with the board design in your altium or your cadence or your uh, eagle then you have to go through the board design phase to get to your virtual prototype that's your your board design and then once you do that you have to connect with Sierra circuits to make the board. Then after the board has been made, you have to do some physical layer test and measurement with instruments. So we have the virtual prototype and the prototype. And the great news is Keysight, as well as in partnership with Sierra circuits, we make a really good partners because not only do we have timely feedback, we can also increase the productivity once you have the virtual prototype and prototype together. Now, as you know, Sierra Circuit has made great circuit boards with high precision, and they provide a lot of great webinars like this one and free tools online. So make sure you check them out. Now, today's learning, they are threefold. First is we're going to take a look at the PCIe Gen 3 traces and learn about the root causes and fixes for impedance discontinuity, return loss, and insertion loss, and how to, how to fix them. And then Mike will, will then look at these very interesting connectors and talk about the case studies of PCI Gen 6, PAM4I diagram, and multi-domain analysis. All right. So first, well, how do you fix an unexpected differential impedance? Before we go there, I want to, you to think about this PCIe Gen 3. If you have experience designing it, there are three choices. What, which impedance would pass the spec? Is it the 71.2, 85, or the 91.5? So in your mind, have an idea. All right. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because everybody is right. We are all winners today. Because in the spec, it actually says the differential data trace, it ranges from 68 to 105. So all, all these in the range will work just fine. However, say if you have eight different differential pairs, it will be kind of silly to have one that is 68, 69, 60, uh, 70, 71, 2, 3, 4, 5. It's kind of silly to do that. So we have this one impedance to rule them all situation where all of them are going to be 91.5. So then the trace width and the spacing would be the same for all of them. Now next, I'm going to show you a quick demo on how to, to find something when with the, with EP scan. So usually what you will see is a, a layout board file like this. And how do we find whether a PCIe traces the impedance is, is wrong? 
what I'll do is usually I'll bring in now bring it in into electrical performance scan to do that. Let's see. So we'll, we all navigate to desktop, EP scan demo. So this one is board one, and I'll create it for. So as the board is importing, we will look for the PCIe traces. All right, so we have to enter the substrate stack up. And right now, the loss model is frequency dependent because I want I want a really quick answer. We do have we do have a frequency dependent loss model. And now here I will type in PCIe TX zero to seven. That's I know their names. And now I'll select all of them. And then P. So select all of them drag them now and since since i have a spec ready i'll analyze it to the tx demo spec and once i click run in two minutes or maybe not two minutes maybe it's 30 seconds we'll find out that uh look at here px tcie tx4 is different than all the other ones it's 104 instead of 91. So that's the uh, that's our demo. So we'll have a differential impedance that is different. All right. So recap. We we did analysis on these PCIe Gen 3 traces and we found a different differential impedance in the layout. Now what we're gonna do is look at what the parameters and with their impact on the differential pair, differential impedance. So we have two, uh, one, two, three, four, five, 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 well, by the width is the same. So four different parameters. So we have width, spacing, substrate height, and dielectric constant. Well, what we'll do is I'm gonna, I wrote down some equations here, did my homework, and we can look a little closer on the relationship, but I'll first simplify it. The differential impedance is proportional to the substrate height over a decay and width. What this means is that if we increase the substrate height, the differential impedance would increase. If we decrease the spacing, the differential impedance would decrease. And the same way, if we decrease the width, since it's inverse proportional, the impedance would increase. If we decrease the dielectric constant, the differential impedance would increase. All right, so that's what I, here's a summary of what, what I've said so far. Now, how do we fix it? We know the impedance is higher, and let's see what the problem looks like. Discard. So over here, we can look. Right now in the 104, the width is 4.72, and the spacing is 5.91. If we want to make this impedance lower, that means we will decrease the spacing, right? And let's see, let's go, let's go to this one. In, oh, indeed. So from 5.91, we change it to 4.72. And the same way from 4.72, increase the spacing to lower the impedance, 5.91. Any questions so far? Any questions so far? No questions in the Q&A? Good. All right, so we found our reason to do a quick recap because the only thing that I was changing between all these A traces will be the either the width or the spacing. They're on the same substrate and dielectric constant. To decrease it, we, we concluded that we can make the trace width a little wider, increase the trace width, and the trace spacing narrower. And that's exactly what we did as a summary here. 104, the trace width is 4.7, and we increase the width to decrease the impedance. And for the spacing, we decrease the spacing. And from, from this, 
from this table, you can kind of see that, well, maybe someone entered the dimensions re in, in the wrong order. But this will be a quick way to bring up your board and just do a quick check very quickly. Now, second, how do we fix an unexpected differential S101? I do see a, oh, yeah, simulation software name is Electrical Performance Scan, and this will be a part of the, the slide deck. How do we fix the unexpected SDD211? Well, before the, before I, before we do that, let's take a look at the SDD11 and what's happening in different frequency ranges. Here I have, have shown the, a trace that is our differential pair, PCIe Gen 3 trace. It's about 3.25 inches. Now I want to know what's going to happen at low frequency. So I'll, I'll start at uh, 12 gigahertz, let's say. The wavelength is about 500 mils. I did a quick ruler check for this trace. 500 mils is about right in the middle. Right in the middle. That's at 12 gigahertz. If we decrease the frequency, if we decrease the frequency to about 1.2, then, then the wavelength is about 5 inches. It's all over the, the trace. Now, what this tells us is that the voltage or current variation exists in the span of the physical length. And if you have if you have heard Eric Bogatin, Dr. Eric, he would say this is the transmission line effect. Transmission line effect. Now we're gonna turn it down to very, very low frequency. What's gonna happen at 1.2 kilohertz? Well, at low frequency, we'll expect the wavelength will get even longer and in fact it is 7.8 miles 7.8 miles so that's many many kilometers so that's that looks like this and you can see that it's extending outside of my computer screen and the fact is there will be no voltage or current variation in the span of the physical length so there's no transmission effect at low frequency what that tells us is going to reflect on the SDD11 is that at low frequency and interconnect on transparent, they are transparent. But what, does, what does that mean? What does that mean in an SDD11 situation parameter? Well, what is SDD11? The answer is it is what is reflected back to port one when I send a signal from port one. And so it's one by one. Reflection coefficient for those microwave engineers brought up with microwave engineering. Now we have we have said that our our expectation is interconnects are transparent at low frequency, which means well there is these are choices. Zero dB is everything's reflected back, and minus thirty dB is very little is reflected back. When it's transparent at low frequency, we expect down here. Nothing is reflected back, large negative dB. And as the plot shows, as we go higher and higher frequency, there will be ripples in your SDD101 plot. And that is transmission line effect happening right in front of your eyes. I'll pause for a question. All right, so there's a question about even mode and odd mode. And We'll take that offline because that one is more technical than for this, this, uh, the rest of the presentation. But we'll, we'll talk about it. And Ankit, please uh, send me an email afterwards too. Next, all right, let's take a look at how does it look like when SDD1 is unexpected? So in my review, we expect a large negative, large negative dB value at the very low frequency. So that's, I'm going to leave this place and then. I might use the same software, again, electrical performance scan. I'm gonna open a new project with the name example number two. And I'm gonna do underscore S for CR circuits. We'll repeat the same steps and get to say okay for the dielectric setup. So loading successfully. 
we'll do PCIe TX seven. Wrap it down, and again, I'll do the simulation. So these are the steps, and voila, we're ready to run. Usually, if you're using other other software tools to analyze the board, it would take a while to to set up and run. But an electrical performance scan, the goal is to to get a good answer right now so we simplify the steps for you so you can just quickly get the answers all right so now everything looks fine impedance wise but let's take a look at the return loss we expected the low frequency sdd11 should be zero db very large negative all right so most of them are large negative db values except for all oh, these ones so one of them is so that's this one tx0 p and n this failed so i know i know what they look like so i know tx0 failed let me go find them so this one is ex1 i'm going to import i'm going to click a new one i'm going to go to import tx2 and we'll see what tx0 has to show us All the boards in here. I'll zoom in to TX0. TX0 right here. Wow. Okay. Well, we see that these are not connected correctly. Maybe the designer didn't drag it all the way down. Maybe something were happening with the pads. But, you know, with EP scan, we quickly identify the trace is TX0. We know something is broken. And now, We'll fix it by connecting them. There we go. Any questions so far? I will I will pause and wait for questions. Let's see. Very good. Okay. All right, no questions. So we're moving on. Do a quick summary. By looking at the plot, we notice that there is a unexpected SDD11, meaning that at low frequencies, we first expect it to be large negative dB value, but it was at zero dB. That told us everything is getting reflected back. And then we identify the root cause to be the unconnected net. Now, the final thing we're gonna learn today is how to fix the unexpected SDD21. We'll take the same steps. We'll talk about what happens at low frequency. What do we expect? Usually there are, there are a few choices. There are a few choices. But before that, well, I'll demonstrate what SDD21 means. It means what is transmitted to port two when I send a signal from port one is two byte one, two byte one, two byte one. Now the choices are number one, zero dB. That means everything is transmitted. Everything is transmitted. And large negative dB value, that means nothing is transmitted. Nothing is transmitted. And I would expect at low frequency, I will see right here, everything is transmitted. Okay. Now let's see how it looks like. Okay. I have a question for the audience right now before we're looking at the sdd11 when everything's reflected when f when everything's reflected that would mean nothing is transmitted which means we would expect sdd21 for the same trace to be large negative db value is that correct let's see so I'm highlighting the same trace here, TX0, and I'm going from the return loss to insertion loss, SDD21 here. So I'm expecting a large negative dB value. And the moment of truth, here I go. Beautiful. 
right here is minus 200. That is a very large neg negative dB value. In fact, that is the numerical numerical noise floor for the for the float floating point. But if you don't believe me, we can look at the other ones that didn't fail. So I would expect TX1 to be okay. And see, right there, we started at zero. So everything is what we expected. This one, these two. Cool. And how do we fix it? We'll fix it the same way we fixed the SDD 101 by connecting them. Now, in the part where we talked about SDD 11, we mentioned what well, what what's going to happen when the frequency goes higher and higher. Here, the rule of thumb is 0.1 dB per inch per gigahertz. So it, it will look something like a, a linear, and the slope is 0.1 dB per inch per gigahertz. So we can do some quick math here. If the trace the trace is three inches, and we have t at 10 gigahertz and a 0.1 dB. So you have about, about roughly 3 dB. But so this is a very rough estimate. So it would be between 3 to 4 dB in SDD21. And you know, that, that's a straight, let's, let's see, let's fact check myself. See if it's 3 dB, right? Discard. If we look at a trace that's connected, so now this one, this one is disconnected. If we look at TX1 and 10 gigahertz, I should expect something between three and minus four dB. So there we go. Yeah, so exactly what we'd expect. It's between three and four dB. So that's what I would expect. Very well. Now let's take a look at the summary for simulation. This is the million dollar slides. It took me six years and maybe a hundred something K to come up with this slide. First, we took a look at the differential pair with different width, height, and spacing. We're trying to figure out, you know, what, what are the parameters that contributes the impedance difference? And we learned that way to decrease the differential impedance, we need to make the trace width wider and the trace spacing narrower, given the same substrate. And we encounter this disconnected net but we found out really quickly, instead of going to into the layout and then visually inspect it, we actually use the software and then boom, in no time, we knew that something is wrong because we have the knowledge of SDD11 and SDD21. And I'm gonna review real quick. For SDD11, it's port one by port one, what's reflected back. And we have the choices of zero dB when everything is getting reflected back minus 30 dB when very little is reflected back. And our expectation is at low frequency, we'll start with a large negative dB value and have ripples as we go up. Same thing for SDD21, we expect a zero dB, everything is transmitted. And as the frequency goes higher and higher, we'll see a 0.1 dB per inch per gigahertz, roughly increase. All right, and that concludes the portion of simulation. And I'll hand this over to Mike. And while he's setting up, I will check the the questions and the Q and A. Very good. Thank you, Tim. And you. Uh, can you see my desktop? Okay. Yes, sir. And hear my voice. Very good. Mm -hmm. uh, so Tim, uh, Tim talked about um, our simulation tools, uh, one of many that Keysight has. And what I'm going to do now is talk about some of our hardware tools. Uh, so doing test and measurement of interconnect, like printed circuit boards, um, motherboards, connectors, cables, these are all linear passive devices. And so it's important to do both um, simulation and measurements and then correlate the two. So this is how our, our two tools work well together. So looking at the 30,000 foot level, why do we think that the signal integrity problems are getting to be so terrible? 
Well, if you look historically, our digital communication buses used to be parallel, and now they've gone serial, just like PCI Express, Rapid IO, Serial ATA, USB, Advanced TCA, and we're getting into the gigabit per second regime. Well, as these data rates increase, the rise time from a logical zero to a logical one become faster, right? Well, as those rise times become faster, for a given circuit board trace in green that has impedance discontinuity, so if you say this has a 50 ohm impedance and this is maybe 75 ohm back to 50 and then maybe 25 ohm, for a given printed circuit board trace, as the rise times get faster, the reflections get bigger. So this bigger reflection in the channel is what's causing so much chaos in, in high-speed digital systems today, like network and data centers, everything on the um, internet infrastructure, um, including the cloud, all the hyperscalers, you know, so all of the components that we fabricate out of printed circuit boards, even though they have active components like amplifiers and filters, that linear passive interconnect becomes a very critical bottleneck that we have to characterize. And this is why we spend so much time with these tools, teaching our, our customers how to use them. And so this is why uh, frequency domain data now is so important to learn. So this is why Tim is going through all the efforts here to talk about scattering parameters, um, differential insertion loss, and differential return loss. So um, even though we may have uh, a good understanding of time domain data, like TDR, time domain reflectometry, uh, we can also get a good analogy for these frequency domain measurements. And that's what I'm going to uh, introduce to you here with some, some intuitive concepts. So first of all, why, why, do we, why do we use differential channels for high-speed digital signals? Well, it turns out we get this benefit called common mode rejection ratio, or CMR. What that means is if you have two traces that are coupled, they can actually reject any incident radiation that's hitting both of them equally. And so uh, this is a good thing. This just gives us noise immunity. It reduces crosstalk and mode conversion and all those nasty things that'll wreak havoc on the receiver that's trying to differentiate between a logic zero and a logic one. So this is why we go to these, what we call differential architectures for our circuit topology. Well, this is, this is a wonderful benefit of noise rejection, but there's a little caveat that there is a little price that we pay with slightly more complicated analysis. So if we only had a single ended line, there would be one input and one output, right? So that'd be a, a two port measurement. With a differential channel like we have here, we have two inputs and two outputs so that's a four port measurement. Okay, so for that reason, we need to investigate and understand what differential S parameters look like. So first, let's start with the basics of, of two single-ended traces. So what that means is this little graphic in green, let's say these two golden traces are separated far enough where there's no coupling. Well, then we have two different ways to represent this mathematically. On the right-hand side over here, we have these 16 time domain parameters. And on the left-hand side, we have 16 frequency domain parameters. And on the right, if you look at the diagonal elements T11 through T44, if you use that same nomenclature Tim talked about, we know that this is all reflection terms. So we have time domain reflectometry in blue, but if we just do simple mathematics, which is, um, let's say, fast Fourier transform, FFT, 
those four reflection terms called TDR now become return loss. So T11, if you do an FFT, becomes S11. And likewise, for all the other parameters here, the ones in yellow on the right-hand side, we call time domain transmission. We do the FFT, we have insertion loss in the frequency domain. Same thing, they just vary by one mathematical function. And same thing with near end crosstalk and far end crosstalk. So the point here is there's a unique one to one mapping between the time domain parameters and the frequency domain parameters. So it's easy to understand the frequency domain by leveraging our understanding of the time domain. So if you understand TDR and you know an oscilloscope, uh, you can use that analogy to understand insertion loss and return loss. Okay, so this is for single-ended lines, but now let's bring these two traces close, closer together. So there's coupling and we get that, that nice common mode rejection ratio. What happens is the single-ended S parameters on the left can be transposed into the differential S parameters on the right. And this transposition can be done with a something we call linear superposition. The reason we can use linear superposition and transform these single-ended S parameters into differential is because they're linear and they're passive devices. So printed circuit boards, cables, connectors, these are all linear and passive. So this linear superposition theory holds and now we can dive into what we want to ultimately understand, which are these differential S parameters. Okay, so again, if we think of that graphic, two input and two output for the differential channel, it's a total of four ports. This gives us a four by four matrix of S parameters. And we break it into four quadrants to make it easy. In the upper left, we have what's known as differential in, differential out. This is the most important quadrant because this is the real world. All of our differential circuits have a differential transmitter and then a differential receiver. So we always analyze these numbers first. And that's why Tim took the time to describe the differential return loss and the differential insertion loss. In the lower right, we have quadrant four, which is common in and common out, probably the least useful of all four quadrants. The interesting quadrants are what I call quadrants two in the upper right and quadrant three in the lower left. These are what we call mixed mode S parameters. And this, this tells us how much mode conversion is present in a differential channel. And in a, in a purely symmetric, well-balanced differential pair, there should be zero mode conversion. So we want all of these four, four parameters here and four parameters here to be close to zero as possible. And the reason is because this tells us how well we have EMI susceptibility or EMI emissions. So in other words, these are bad things. We don't want to be susceptible to EMI. We, we want to reject the EMI. We want that good common mode rejection ratio. Likewise, we don't want any emissions coming from our differential pair. Okay, so this is kind of the fundamental uh, way to look at differential S parameters. Now, Keysight has a very broad product portfolio uh, with hardware and software for time domain and frequency domain and protocol analyzers. Out of all of these um, test and measurement tools, we're going to focus right in here with the physical layer interconnect. We've got these design tools like ADS and EP scan. We have instruments like vector network analyzers where we can analyze these digital interconnect using what's called vector network analyzers. Here's a four port, 67 gigahertz vector network analyzer. Now, let's take a design case study. Let's look at this 
uh, PCIe Gen 6 riser. What are these risers, what are they needed for? Well, when you go to these faster generation um, PXI type devices, we need to conform to these routers and, and switches in a very small space. And sometimes you just don't have enough room to put these big vertical daughter cards into um, a backplane. So we have these risers. And so this helps us with the space constraints inside the router and the switch, uh, better graphics processing unit placement, uh, it gives us better cooling and overall enhances the performance of the server. However, on the downside, we do introduce another complex component into the channel. And anytime we have another component with connectors, there's uh, opportunity for reflections, the amplitude to degrade and to have timing jitter, which are all bad things. So we have to do comprehensive signal integrity analysis. And when we do PCIe Gen 6, the new measurements for this standard include crosstalk measurements, PAM4I diagram, and insertion loss. And over here, you can see a graphic where we have a modular vector network analyzer that's scalable. So you have a, a chassis where each slot is a completely independent two-port vector network analyzer. So you can start with only two ports if you want. And then as your budget allows and your needs increase, you can expand to get a total of 32 ports. And there's a family of these modules where you can start with very low frequency, like nine gigahertz for slower data rates and go all the way up to 53 gigahertz for the fastest 112 gigabit per second data rates for gigabit ethernet. And the software that I'm going to show you now is something we call physical layer test system software or PLTS. And here's the part number for that. So we're measuring with a vector network analyzer to get S parameters. And there's just a few easy steps that you need to go through to achieve that. First, just choose whichever VNA that meets your needs, the frequency and the number of ports. There's a step-by-step -step calibration wizard that will walk you through how to calibrate to the reference plane at the front panel of your hardware. Then collect your S parameters through the measurement. You can create a test template for this type of multi-domain analysis where we have both time domain, like the impedance or TDR, which we said was T11, or crosstalk in time domain, or crosstalk in frequency domain, differential insertion loss. So, so once you have that S parameter, we can have the software tools do that FFT, IFFT that we talked about earlier. So you can view both domains and bounce between the domains very quickly to gain insight into what's going on. And I'm gonna show you how to do that. And then you can experiment with I diagrams, this pulse amplitude modulation with four levels. So instead of non-return to zero NRE, where there's just two levels of a zero and a one. This PAM4 has four levels, zero, one, two, and three. And then we could do fancy things with simulation inside the uh, software for pre-emphasis equalization at all data rates and characterize crosstalk insertion loss. And then finally generate a test report. So how is this, how is this done step-by-step? Step? Well, if we have the S parameters, we can generate the I diagram and we can use what's called multi-channel simulation in the PLTS tool. And this green graphic here with the traces represents the S parameter that you just measured. And for a four port differential channel, um, you would have a two input and two output. What we're showing here is a multi-port measurement with many channels. Remember, I said that you could go up to 32 ports if you wanted, okay? But then you can take this 
multi-channel simulation dialog box, drag and drop a virtual transmitter and a virtual receiver, and you can add jitter, you can do pre-emphasis, and you can vary the virtual pattern generator to see how your device will work as you increase the data rate. Because at some point, you're going to be able to push a fast enough data stream to where it'll fail. And you wanna know where that point is. So this is the best way to do that, is to use your virtual pattern generator after you've measured a real world device and you've got those S parameters of that prototype, then you can run simulation on the, on the actual measurement. So the, this, is the, this is the way the tool works. So you can generate the PAM4i, right? There's four levels, zero, one, two, and three. And you can add jitter. So this jitter injection is a way to simulate if you have a pattern generator that may be adding uh, error in the time domain. So you can have like a, a faulty uh, clock that is unstable that will change the way the, uh, the eye looks and close it horizontally. And then you can also virtually add amplitude noise, white Gaussian noise, which would be vertical noise and close the eye vertically. And then finally, you can go over here to the receiver, this virtual receiver, and you can add what's called equalization. So these are all very, um, very simple tools that can be used with just these dialog boxes with all the wizards without having to build a schematic, right? So if you've, if you've used some of these advanced simulation tools, uh, they're not the easiest to develop the schematic to start the simulation. Well, this tool, PLTS, was made to use simulation without schematics because you're using the real-world measurements from your prototype. Okay? So here's more examples of looking at uh, PCIe Gen 6 crosstalk analysis. We can put all foreign crosstalk on one plot if we have this multi-port S parameter, all near-end crosstalk on one, all differential TDR on one. So you can see an outlier if you have one, right? So if Tim showed you that one example where the traces weren't connected, you want that to pop out when you look at all of the waveforms on one plot, and, and that's what will happen. I'll show you how to do that. And again, we're using this virtual, uh, actually, this is a, a um, scalable network analyzer that goes up to 32 ports. And then here, um, a second design case study is showing this actual device Tim was talking about, where we have these traces and there's uh, 16 ports with uh, eight input, eight output, so four differential pair. And you can see the outlier right here. When you plot all the reflection TDR waveforms on one plot. And, and you can go up to many ports if you wanna do uh, analysis of all the ports at once. So it's, you have your choice. You can do fewer ports or you can do all of the ports. It's up to you. Okay, so let's take a look on how this actually works. So I'm gonna launch the physical layer test system software. And you, it will detect instruments, right? Because the main way, the main tool is to make measurements in your signal integrity lab. Right now, I'm in my cubicle, so I don't have an instrument. It says, let's operate in analysis mode only. So we'll do a virtual tool. Um, just to show you briefly, if you were in the lab with an instrument, here's what the calibration wizard looks like. It will show you which instrument you're hooked up to with address and it'll allow you to do a calibration of that vector network analyzer, and it automatically sets the time base and the step size, and you can drop down menu to pick the type of calibration, short, open, load, or through, through reflect line, line reflect match. You can create probe cal kits if you want to do that sort of thing, and applying the cal kit 
to the device and then walking through, you just basically change the standard on the end of the cable and make measurements of the standards and walk all the way through. And it won't let you go forward until you've done all of the ports and all of the standards. So it's really kind of easy to walk through and calibrate what normally is, is, a, is a very camp complicated thing to do. We make it very simple. The other way to use this tool is in your cubicle that I'm going to do now, where I load an S-parameter measurement that I made previously. And so here, I'm going to load a Zowie backplane. And the software says, OK, I've got that S-parameter measurement that you made on your VNA last week. How do you want to view the data? You can view it in time domain, frequency domain, I diagram, RLCG, or you can apply a standard template to it. And you can look at it differential or single-ended. Well, I'm, I'm a digital engineer, so I like to start in the time domain. And so here is that four by four matrix that we talked about. Remember that? Here's quadrant one in the upper left, quadrant two in the upper right, quadrant three in the lower left, quadrant four in the lower right. Which quadrant is the most important that we always start with? It's quadrant one. So we can go in here and zoom in. And TDD11, is this reflection or transmission? Well, this is reflection, right? In on port one, out on port one. And so this is simply TDR, time domain reflectometry. And we can change these vertical units from millivolts into ohms by just going down to this button down here that says impedance. And we can auto scale. And now we can drop a marker anywhere on this TDR waveform. And we can measure the impedance of that transmission line. So this PCB trace is 109 ohms. And we have reflections because we have different connectors and via fields in this channel. So this is time domain, right? Now, what happens if we do an FFT on this time domain data? Well, we go to frequency domain. And so we can very quickly use the computing power of the tool and do the FFT on all those waveforms and you remember the analogy that we can leverage the time domain intuition into frequency domain? So what does TDD11 look like when you do an FFT on it? It's SDD11. It's the differential return loss, right? Like Tim said, it's got the ripple that starts at a very low value at low frequency and increases. And we can look at SDD21 or 1-2, which is the forward and reverse insertion loss. At low frequency, we have very little loss. So everything's transmitted. And as we go higher in frequency, it gets more lossy and, and less amplitude is transmitted through the channel. Okay. So time domain, frequency domain, all from the same device, all from one S-parameter measurement that's used a multi-part VNA. And now we can also look at the eye diagram. Right? So it's very simple to use S parameters and to extract eye diagrams. And we can look at, what, we, what did we say? Multi-channel simulation, you remember that? So here we can drag and drop a transmitter and a receiver on either side of our S parameter measurement. And now we can push the data rate to higher data rates. So let's double the data rate. Let's go from two and a half gigabit per second to five. And now let's see what happens. Oh, see that? So the I diagram closes a little bit when we go to a faster data rate. And this is what we would expect, right? Well, how about if we look at PAM4? PCIe Gen 6 needs this PAM4i. Well, we just go to the pattern format and we say PAM4. Okay, draw I. 
And there's our PAM4i. So using that one golden nugget of S parameter data that comes from a very accurate vector network analyzer that's been calibrated with traceable standards to the National Bureau of Standards, you get this information all in one tool. So now if you're a time domain digital guy like I am, you can talk to your microwave colleagues because you can both look at the same data very quickly, very easily. And then you can look at eye diagrams, either NRZ or PAM4, and you can inject jitter, you can add noise, you can increase the data rate. It's kind of a sandbox where you play around and you see what the actual real world problems are that you might encounter and how your device will react. So I see we're running up against top of the hour. Uh, let's take a moment here and see if we have some questions. I guess I don't have questions, so I think that's... Yeah, we're all good. So let's go ahead and wrap up then. And we will go back to... So, Tim, would you like me to wrap up here? Would you like to yeah, step Yeah, go in? right ahead. Go right ahead. So what we've done today is we've showed you just two very simple, easy-to-use test and measurement tools out of the Keysight portfolio that's quite broad. Uh, Electrical Performance Scan is a software tool that is something that you can use quite rapidly to simulate and troubleshoot and design uh, your high-speed traces. And then on the hardware side, we have vector network analyzers that you can make measurements of very accurate S parameters and gain insight by doing multi-domain analysis. And if we've piqued your interest, we would encourage you to go to some of these websites that we've shown here to download some free trial software. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim has a free trial here, a VP scan, along with app notes and some updates with all the major features and how to develop a test plan and do pass fail analysis. And then here we've got the PLTS product page that talks about crosstalk and the scalable vector network analyzer. And then lastly, I would encourage you to go to this link and you can download a free copy of my signal integrity book that I co-authored with Tim's professor, Dr. Eric Bogatin. So there's a lot of information here. I know it probably feels like you're drinking from a fire hose, but uh, we had a lot to cover. And I, I think that uh, if you use these tools and you learn how to be more versatile in your job, uh, you probably will have a more easy time designing circuits that have fewer problems and can function at much higher performance levels. And that's it. Thank you so much for attending. Yeah, and uh, yeah, thank you. And all the slides we shared, Lucy was another slide. And make sure you connect with us on LinkedIn as well. Be good to have a connection with all of y'all. And. Lucy, any, anything else that you want to add? Thank you very much, Mike and team, for presenting with us. All right. Very good. Thanks for your time, and we hope you all have a great day. Mm -hmm. Bye, everyone.